Welcome back to Pace Immigration, paceimmigration.com, talking once again with immigration lawyer Michael O'Rourke. Michael, good to see you. Hey, Sean, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, talking about Jay Treaty again because we get a ton of questions and comments on it on the YouTube channel and through emails to the firm. Uh, the Jay Treaty and Social Security this time is uh, the subject of this video because we do have people ask about accessing social social security, easy for me to say, social security <laughs> and a social security number. Michael, uh, for the uninitiated, take us through a quick recap of the Jay Treaty and then we'll talk about social security. Sure. So after the U.S. War of Independence, the new American government was negotiating with the British crown about boundaries between U.S. and British North America. And one of the um, parts of that negotiation was uh, centered on the rights of movement and hunting and traditional gathering patterns of indigenous folks on both sides of the border. So um, uh, it, it, that specific agreement became enshrined as the J Treaty. Over the years, it was incorporated into U.S. immigration law, but uh, it, on the Canadian side of the border, the Canadian Supreme Court in a, a series of successive opinions decided that it did not apply to the government of Canada. And we have a, a video that goes into the the geeky uh, <laughs> history of it. But suffice it to say is that anybody who has a 50% indigenous blood quantum uh, who is a member of a registered and recognized federal tribe in Canada or of a Métis nation or of the Inuit nation are allowed to come to the U.S. port of entry or a U.S. port of entry and to either seek permanent residence in the U.S., their green card, or uh, to come into the U.S. and work. And in order to the work in the U.S., you need a social security number. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Right, so we have uh, Canadian, indigenous folks living in Canada come down to the USA, they can live there, tourism and whatever, but if they want to work, they have to go through another process, which is of course social security, like everyone else who does work in the US, uh, will require a social security number. We have it here, accessing social security. You might have people asking right off the bat, should I get a social security number? What do you say? Generally, yes. Uh, it is used for so many types of ID in the U.S. Uh, it's, it's always on forms. Uh, if you go to a doctor, they're going to want to see it. Uh, some state driver's licensing. They don't do it anymore, but uh, in Minnesota, you used to have to give your social security number and your social security number was your driver's license number uh oh, interesting. talk about uh <laughs> yeah. talk about uh imperiling your private in information but uh right. yeah so you do need a social security number for anything and especially if you are going to work uh your employer is going to have to withhold uh, uh different uh, Medicare and Social Security um, uh, withholdings against that number. So yes, in general, you're going to need that number for most everything. Okay. Now we've already talked, we touched on uh, who is eligible. Does it make you eligible automatically if you're down there on the J Treaty that you you can just apply for a Social Security number and away you go? Yes. Uh, in short, yes. Uh, if you have come through the port of entry and you've gotten your documents from CBP, uh, then uh, what you do is you take that to a social security office. You can apply online in advance, uh, at least fill out the paperwork. And that's a very easy website, ssa.gov. You can get all of that ready. But in order to apply, you're going to have to wait about 10 days because CBP systems and Social Security Administration systems don't talk to each other very frequently. So, yeah, you're not you're not exactly scaring me with this 10 days. I'm going, you know, we're up here in Canada. We're dealing with the 10 month passport delays or so just getting <laughs> through those. So 10 days sounds pretty good. You said here I've got how long does it take? 10 takes 10 days. Is the procedure pretty much that simple? You go online, fill some stuff out and then you go in and 10 days later, you've got it. Yeah. Uh, anybody who's ever been to a social security office, though, knows that this is where the real uh, hardship takes place because it, it can take a, quite a few hours sitting there. 
applying online in advance makes it a little bit faster. But when you do get to the Social Security office, you are going to need to show your uh, secure Indian card uh, or your Miti card or your Inuit card, your proof of enrollment in a federal federally recognized band or tribe. Uh, you're going to also have to show your blood quantum paperwork, and that's usually the tribal letter or uh, a um, family history uh, by Northern and Indigenous Affairs Canada. And you're going to have to show the paperwork from CBP. So once you have shown that to the officer uh, at Social Security, they're going to process the paperwork they will usually take about another two to three weeks to get you a card in the mail. Uh, they don't give you a temporary number, unlike in Canada. Uh, but when you have uh, started working for an employer, that employer can usually put a placeholder number out until the actual Social Security number comes in. Excellent. Okay, Michael. So that pretty much wraps it up for that part of the GH reading. I'm sure we're going to have more questions in the future. We get them all the time and we'll be happy to come online and answer them for folks. In the meantime, you can contact Michael at morourke at pacelawfirm.com with any immigration questions that you might have. Michael, it's great to see you. Great to see you too, Sean. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.